When Tolstoy wrote this book, A Confession, he had stumbled upon a problem. And it was a problem that forced him to take a step back from his fame, his wealth, his success, his lack of belief, and reevaluate things. What was it about his worldview that had driven him to this place where now he wanted to take his own life? And by writing this book, he came out on the other side of that with a whole new conception of religious faith. And that's the journey of his that I wanna share with y'all in this video. So first let's set the table and get some context. This isn't one book, it's a collection of writings that Tolstoy wrote in his 50s. He's already written Anna Karenina, War and Peace, all of the famous work that we know him for. And ironically, his best known works reflect his actual beliefs the least. Early in his career, he tried to write different stories that focused on morals and traditional values, but they didn't find any traction in the public imagination. He said, every time I tried to write to display a wish to be morally good, I was met with contempt and with scorn. Then I gave into my base desires and I was praised. I began to write of vanity, self-interest, and pride. I wrote without knowing myself what it was I was teaching, and I was paid. I was paid money, lodgings, women, food. I was famous. It must then be the case that what I was teaching was very good. This reception to his work validated Tolstoy's atheism that he had adopted as a result of being disillusioned with the church in his childhood. There wasn't really a market for the old traditions in Russian culture anymore that were more religious and spiritually grounded. People were moving away from the church and towards rationality. And Tolstoy saw himself as a new leader of this movement. His job, as far as he was concerned, was to throw out the old religious dogma and replace those institutions with modern literature and culture. And that served him well. Like I said, he was very successful. He got married, had 10 kids, a, a huge estate. Years go on, he's middle-aged, and by all measures, things are great for him materially. But something began to bother him. He asked this question, reason is the fruit of life, and yet reason rejects life itself. Life is senseless evil, and yet I have lived and I still live, and so too humanity still lives. How can this be? Why do men live when it's possible not to live? Why suffer when you could not suffer? Now, logically speaking, the only answer that he could come up with was, well, if you kill yourself, you don't have to think about that anymore. But that wasn't exactly helpful. And he began to struggle with these suicidal thoughts that began to send him on this downward spiral. It even got so bad at one point he had to quit taking his rifle with him on walks in the woods so he wouldn't be tempted to shoot himself. He had to get to the bottom of this question of is life actually meaningless? So he goes in search of evidence and the first place that he looked was math and science. And pretty quickly he found that that wasn't going to work because as he said, the only answers that mathematical formulas can give you are identities. Now, what's he talking about? We don't want to go down some mathematical rabbit hole here. An identity, simply put, is an equality that relates one expression to another. A equals A. Zero equals zero. And this blew me away because it's so simple, and yet I never thought about it. Of course, if you input zero on one side of an identity equation, you're going to come up with zero on the other side. Math and science don't really deal in these questions pertaining to meaning. There is no mathematical value that can be attached to life. So if you come to the table assuming that the value of life is ultimately zero, which is what atheism implies, atheism kind of tags life with a zero value by default, then yes, if that's the input, the output is going to be zero. Therefore, life doesn't matter, neither do you or I. But if you come to the table with a different set of assumptions, that life is a non-zero identity, what comes out on the other side of that equation is going to be very different. And as he's thinking this through, he, he realizes at one point how ignorant and reductionist his point of view has been all these years. Listen to this. Long ago when life began and of which I know nothing, people who knew the arguments about the vanity of life nevertheless lived 
and brought to life a meaning of their own. Everything that is in me and around me is the fruit of their understanding of life. These very instruments of thought by which I judge life and condemn it were made by them and not by me. I was born, educated, and grew up thanks to them. They taught me how to think, how to speak. I am their offspring, and now I have proved to them that it's all senseless. There's something very wrong here. So now that he's identified that flaw in his logic up to this point, he looked to philosophy. And there were three developments of modern philosophy that really ticked him off. He called them degradations of human thought. He calls out Hegel, Darwin, and Nietzsche. And he was not a fan of these guys, particularly Nietzsche. The more he looked into it, he saw that this question of meaning kept coming up again and again throughout history. And no school of philosophy really wanted to touch it. It seemed to him like a lot of philosophical thought actually went into trying to escape from this question of life's meaning. And there were four main ways that he said people try to do that. The first was ignorance. So being so blissfully unaware that you don't even realize that life is absurd. You, you just don't even think about it. The second was Epicureanism. And that was the idea that life is meaningless, but we should enjoy ourselves because what else are we going to do? The third solution he called strength and energy, which was the suicide route. He thought that committing suicide was an act of bravery. And then the fourth was what he called weakness. And that was people who realize that life is meaningless, but don't do anything about it. They're just kind of drifting through life, waiting to die. So Tolstoy found himself at another dead end, but there was still one place he hadn't looked, and that was religion. And Reluctant as he was, Tolstoy eventually came around to re-examine his childhood faith. He returned to Christianity. He began reading scripture, praying, going to church. But it wasn't long until he found himself back at square one. He realized all of these sermons and rituals were actually destroying his relationship with God rather than helping. He felt less connected to God by going to church than he did just by taking a walk in the woods and observing God's creation. And he figured out why that was. You see, he was there going to church to seek faith and to understand. But the vast majority of the people around him were, were simply there to go through the motions like they were fulfilling an obligation. They weren't concerned with their relationship with God or how God viewed them. They were concerned with how other people and their community viewed them. And, and this was really frustrating because this whole idea of opium of the masses is what had persuaded him to leave Christianity in the first place. But now, being a little older, a little wiser, Tolstoy saw that Christianity wasn't to blame here. The scripture was sound. The issue was the hierarchies of power that people erect around religions. He said equality between all men is a fundamental characteristic of religion. But as soon as a new religion appears, those for whom inequality is an advantage immediately begin to conceal the basic feature of religion. Essentially, human nature quickly rushes in and masks over true religion. So what does that mean? What is a true religion? Tolstoy elaborates and he defines some of the basic principles. There is a God who is the origin of everything. There's an element of this divine origin in every person. This element can be diminished or increased through the way that we live our lives. And to increase this source, we must suppress our passions and increase the love inside of us. And achieving that is done by doing unto others as you wish them to do to you, the golden rule. This drove Tolstoy to return to Christianity, and now he saw it as it was originally laid out in the Gospels. Nonviolence as a basic tenet, the ends don't justify the means. That, that was really important for him. He believed that the church and the state had co-opted Christ's teaching throughout history to justify the violence that they required to uphold their authority. And the solution to this problem, as far as he could see, laid at the feet of individuals. He saw a religion based on individuals seeking to improve themselves 
through the true tenets of Christianity, focused on daily progress of the soul's liberation from the illusions of the flesh and material existence, striving towards the central tenet, which is love. Now, that's all great, but Tolstoy still had to answer the question, what, why does he exist? Why should he live? What, why should he go through the trouble of improving himself, acting in love? Why do this at all? And for Tolstoy, that could only be reconciled through faith. Faith was the bridge that you're required to cross over if you want to transcend the inevitable nihilism that comes along as a consequence. In fact, he identified faith as the catalyst that allows human beings to begin the work of bringing about that state of unity and of love that Christ and the gospel said was already within us. You see, Without faith, we're locked into this cycle of self-interest and biological scarcity that there's no escape from. This is the story of human history, violence and oppression, tit for tat. One group attacks, the other group suffers, and then they retaliate. And we never stop to realize that regardless of which side we're on, by participating in this cycle, we're perpetuating our own oppression. Faith is what delivers us from that prison. And without it, the prisoner's dilemma takes over and the incentives favor survival of the fittest, deception, and gain at the expense of others. And we can't rely on social progress without this guiding principle of faith. Tolstoy said something like to allege that social progress is what produces morality is the same thing as saying that a stove produces heat. Stoves in themselves can't produce heat. What they have to have inside them is wood and wood is a product of the sun. In the same way, God is the sun that animates our religious understanding of the world. And that is what we use as a scaffolding to construct our understandings of morality. That's why Tolstoy concluded that where there's faith, there is life. So I loved reading this book. Uh, if you want to read it, I would recommend that you do. If you have, I would love to hear what you think about it in the comments. And if you like this video, you may want to check out my review of Dostoevsky's book, The Idiot. I talk a lot about similar themes. So uh, thank you for stopping by and I'll see y'all next time.